Let the church say amen. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen. You want to stay in the will of the Lord. Amen. No matter what comes, there's going to be a temptation, amen, for you to step out of the will, step out of the character of God. Amen. But you've got to stay right there in the will of the Lord. Let's give God a big praise. Amen. For our musicians and our choir, the male chorus. Amen. Blessing us, blessing us, blessing us. To God be the glory. I want to really give a big shout out. Amen. To Brother Mike. Amen. Filling in on the piano. To God be the glory. Step right in there. Amen. And Mike, you got to answer your phone. I try to call you this when you got to answer your phone. I want to just call you and tell you thank you. And then the wife said, he'll never pick up his phone. I know. I just want to call and tell him thank you. So I said, I'm going to wait till he gets to church. I'm going to embarrass him right good uh, and tell him thank you, thank you, thank you for stepping in and filling in. To God be the glory. Give some big shout out to Brother Mike. Amen. Next time, answer the phone. <laughs> Don't put that on the table, amen. Make sure we, we edit that out. But I do appreciate, amen. He came in, walked in one Sunday. I said, Mike, can you feel in? He stepped right in to God be the glory. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. To God be the glory. That's the kind of folk, that, amen. Every church needs people like that. They'll step right in, amen. If they'll figure it out and make things work. Let God use them for the glory of God. Sometimes that's when God uses you the best. Amen. When you weren't expecting, you were just willing. Amen. You were just available. That's a shot right there. Sometimes God will bless you. Amen. You, you just, you just, you weren't going to grow. You just say, no, I'll do it. No problem. No problem. And that's when God does a great work in your life. Praise God. Uh, going to our scripture today, Philippians chapter two, um, we read verses one through 16, but let me just anchor our sermon in this one verse. In verse five, it says, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And I want to minister from that very simple subject, the mindset of Christ. The mindset of Christ. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, let's go to, we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your love and your kindness that showers us over and over again. Now, Lord, we ask for an anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Speak, Holy Spirit, in the name of Christ right now. Speak now so that we might have all that we need. Anoint us afresh for this work in Jesus' name. And all the people of God said, amen. The mindset said of Christ. Beloved, you already know the church is not the building. Uh, that became more and more apparent when COVID hit this country real hard. Uh, the church is and has always been the people of faith, the people united through Christ. The church is those folk who are saved by grace, justified by faith, pardoned of all their sins, filled with the Holy Ghost, and the folks who've been called out of darkness into the marvelous light. That is the church. Amen. It's not the brick and mortar. It's the people united in Christ. The church is the people of God connected like a body made up of many parts. No, Paul said we don't have the same function in the book of Corinthians, but we're all needed to fulfill the plan of God in the earth. Just like an arm can't say to a leg, it doesn't need them. So no member of the body of Christ can say to another member, we don't need you in the body of Christ, for we all need each other. The mindset of Christ reminds reminds us that we need each other and we need each other oftentimes more than we know. Uh, that's why the devil tries to cause division in the church and tries to cause members and, uh, to get in and, and break up members because uh, he, the devil knows that if we are together on one accord, there isn't much that we can do. Let me say it again. The devil wants to divide the church, separate the church, get us fussing and grumbling and complaining with one another because it knows that we get on one accord. Hallelujah. There isn't much that we can do. If we pray on one accord, those who are sick get healed. If we pray on one accord, folk get blessed. When we pray on one accord, miracles happen. Even But if we are divided and separated, it hurts the power of the church. That's why there is such a temptation to backbite and tattle instead of reconciling in the church. We really do need each other. And when we forget that we need each other, we are tempted to disrespect, harm, and hinder other believers in Christ. Uh, so we must keep a clear understanding 
that every member of the, of the body of Christ is vital to the success of God's church in the world. We all have crucial roles and responsibilities to advance the kingdom on this world in preparation for the next. This is something that we can't do individually, but something that is done collectively. None of us, let me say it, has enough gifts. None of us has that much money. None of us has that much time. Uh, some have more money to give, some have more time to offer, and some have special talents that enhance the work of God, but none of it, let me say it again, none of it can be done by one person. None of us can do it alone. We need each other. The mindset of Christ tells us we can't do it alone, but we must be united on one accord. The work of the church, let's not forget, is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can't do that alone. To build up believers, we can't do that alone. To minister love and compassion to this dying world, we can't do that alone. The mission of the church is not something that any one person can do by themselves. The mission is only done when we are united as one. When the church is functioning properly, great ministry can be achieved. When the church is operating properly, lives are changed and people see the light of Christ and are prompted to ask, what must I do to be saved? The church, the people of God, are supposed to work to set an atmosphere where the beauty of Christ is on display for all the world to see. The church has the responsibility to properly represent the church in this world, or like we say in church, to witness to this world the love of Christ through our actions and our words. Uh, we're supposed to be, as Paul says, ambassadors for Christ. Uh, and how can we be ambassadors for Christ without the mind of Christ? The light of Christ is supposed to shine through us in such a way that we look and act radically different. The compassion we're supposed to have, the willingness to aid and assist one another, to offer care and concern to one another, should stand hands and heads and tails over any other organization on this earth. The church, y'all, is supposed to be different. In the book of Acts, when it says the church had so much love and concern for each other that they would sell property to help others in need. That's, that level of concern may not be as prevalent today, but we need it to return. To, we need to return to that radical love and concern for each other. The American way of being so concentrated on me and mine has kept us from being radically compassionate like Jesus has called us to be. For when you have the mind of Christ, You'll put other needs before yourself. Oh, we need the mind of Christ, so we'll be compassionate like Christ. Uh, the church is to be radically different than any other group. This is God's plan for the church, that we might shine in this dark world. This is the purpose that God has given us as believers, to share Christ, build up believers, ministers to this world, but we are not able to do this separately or individually. This can only be done with us united. And therefore, we've got to handle if we're going to do it united, we've got to handle each other. Let me say it. We've got to handle each other carefully and compassionately. We must work hard to edify each other and not tear down each other. This is why we've got to be careful with our words and the tones we use towards one another. This is why we got to work hard and show patience with, patience with one another. This is why we must do the work without grumbling and complaining about one another. For the minute mindset of Christ calls us to be united. The mindset of Christ helps us obey the kingdom speed limits that I went over last week. When you got the mindset of Christ, you're going to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to be angry. When you have the mindset of Christ, it helps you to be quick to reconcile, slow to hold a grudge, but quick to forgive. When we have the mindset of Christ, it is a beautiful thing. And because so, well, it's so beautiful that being part of a church should be one of the best things you've done in your life. Because when you don't want to miss out on the fact that, uh, that the Bible says iron sharpens iron and so that we sharpen one another when we're together in fellowship on one accord, the fellowship blesses you. Uh, you don't want to miss out on a testimony that can encourage you to trust God even more. You have that in the fellowship. Uh, you don't want to be separated from the body and miss a blessing from one of the prayers of the saints, amen. When the saints of God pray for you and bless you, you don't want to be separated from the body and miss out on a blessing someone might be willing to give you when they 
found out you were in need. You don't want to be distant from the church folks when being closer may have prevented you uh, from getting uh, messed up in life. See, I found out if you stay close to the church and close to the people of God, oftentimes somebody has some wisdom that you need, and when you get it from them, it'll save you a whole lot of trouble in your life. Uh, you don't want to go through sickness alone. You really want some folk that can pray for you, support you, be there for you. You really don't want to grieve alone. Uh, you need somebody to support you and strengthen you. That's what a church ought to do, but we can't do that separately. One person can't do that by themselves. It takes all of us rolling up our sleeves, working together, serving one another, and you serve one another because there's going to come a time where you're going to need somebody to come help you. You're going to need somebody to come bless you. You're going to hope somebody sends you a car. We've got to work together and serve one another. Uh, uh, there, there are too many benefits uh, from being close to, to other church folk uh, uh, you don't want to miss out on. Uh, uh, the faith that I have now is a direct result of being connected to some church mothers who showed me through their example how to handle some sickness. Uh, the faith that I have now is a direct result of being connected to some brothers who knew how to pray when you're going through the storms of life. Uh, I, I, I believe in miracles because I've seen it happen in the life of folk I know in this church. Amen. I'm not scared of cancer because I've seen God work it out in somebody's life. Uh, I'm not scared of this and that because I've seen God open doors. I'm not scared of losing money because I've seen God give folk uh, double for their trouble. Uh, I'm not scared of going through death because I've seen God give somebody beauty for the ashes and give them the oil of gladness for the mourning in their life. I've seen it too many times because I've connected. And I'm telling you, you need other church folk, other saints, amen, to walk with. But if, we don't, if we're not in one accord, if we're grumbling and fighting, it hinders, amen, our relationship with God and hinders our relationship with another and hinders us from the blessings that are received when we are together. Because I can tell you, I've seen too many healings, too many breakthroughs, too many folk get delivered off drugs, amen, not to trust God more and more. I can't tell you how many times somebody's testimony has encouraged me to run on just a little, a little while longer. Oh, if it had not been for the fellowship with other believers, I wouldn't have the faith that I have. My faith has been strengthened through my connection with fellow church members who had the mindset of Christ. Well, what's the point I'm trying to make here, church? The people of God were designed by God to be connected for the work, and we benefit from being together, and we suffer when we are divided. Uh, this is what the apostle has as his rationale when writing this section of the letter to the Philippian church. Paul knows that the church is what the church is supposed to look like, and he knows believers uh, are supposed to act a certain way, and he knows the benefits of when all this happens when folk get together and they all have the mindset of Christ. So Paul is motivated to keep the believers in Philippi on track with God's purpose and plan for their lives. And I believe these Holy Ghost-inspired words that we hear in our scripture can bless us even today. For it's at this point in the letter, uh, as Paul's already, uh, if you read chapter one, he's already thanked God for the Philippian church. He's already shared in chapter one how much joy he has about them. He's already shared how excited he is about what God is doing in their lives, how, 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 is how, how what they are going through has kept them, how, how God is gonna perfect them and make them even stronger. Paul is excited about this church. He's in prison, but knowing how they are growing in God, he lets them know it has blessed him, has encouraged him, it has strengthened him, knowing that they are growing in God and doing great things for the Lord and the faith that they have. It is giving Paul a great amount of joy. So Paul is very excited about this church. He's overjoyed with how they are growing and maturing in the faith. And like any good spiritual father, he is concerned that something might take them off track. Something might take them off course. Uh, the apostle knows that the one thing that will keep a church operating correctly is if all its members have the mindset of Christ. The mindset of Christ is that crucial element to all of this. This is being spirit-led and guided by the example of Christ. Let me say it again. The mindset of Christ is being spirit-led and guided by the example of Christ. The example of Christ is most important. It's the mindset of Christ that allows us to really work together and holds us together in love. Paul explains this mindset in verses 6 through 7 when he states that Christ, being in the very nature of God, 
God, which meant highly exalted, full of glory and magnificent, voluntarily, this is the word, reduced himself to the position of a servant so that we all might benefit. Let me say it again. Jesus Christ in the very nature of God meant highly exalted, glorious, magnificent, uh, sits on high, reduced himself so that he can serve all of us and save all of us. Uh, the highest one went down to the lowest position. Uh, uh, he voluntarily reduced himself and nobody forced him. He didn't have to. Christ didn't need us. We needed Christ. Uh, and Christ came because we could not come to him. That's shouting material. Christ made all the effort. Give God praise. Christ did all the work. You ought to shout. Christ didn't wait to be sir, but he came to sir when he washed the disciples' feet recorded in John 13. He was showing them an example of the kind of service we are to give to each other. He bowed down, washed their feet prior to his death. He was showing them and he's showing us that the greatest must serve the lowest. Oh, that's shouting material. We normally have that in reverse where the greatest just barks out orders to the lowest and demands the lowest serve them. But that is not the example of Christ. That is not the mindset of Christ. Christ voluntarily reduced himself to serve sinners. Christ voluntarily reduced himself to serve folks who doubted him. Christ voluntarily reduced himself for folks who questioned him. Christ voluntarily reduced himself to save all of us. For all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. God, but the greatest one descended down to serve the lowest. Uh, that shouting material, and that is the mindset of Christ. Ah, uh, He put our needs ahead of His glory. And if we are believers in Christ, say folks with the spirit of Christ on the inside of us, that means we've got to have the same mindset of being willing to serve and serve, amen, everyone. We can't be saved and hold on to the mindset that we learn from the street. We can't be saved and follow the mindset we learn, learn in corporate America or on our job. Uh, we've got to have the mindset of Christ, and that means uh, the highest has to serve the lowest. Uh, that, 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 that mindset requires that we humble ourselves before God and humble ourselves before the, uh, each other. Humbling ourselves to God is when we submit to God's plan, God's will, and God's agenda. You can't have the mindset of Christ if you're not willing to submit and humble yourself to God's will, God's plan, and God's agenda. Write that down. Uh, that's why Paul says in, in verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Let me, let me break it down. The church is not ours. It belongs to God. This is not our ministry. This is God's ministry. These are not our resources. These are God's resources. This is God's body. It's God's talent. We are, God, we are just stewards and managers over all that God has put us in charge. Let me say it again. This ain't Pastor Hodges Church. This ain't the trustees church. This ain't the deaconess church. This ain't the deaconess church. This ain't the ministry leaders church. This ain't the choir's church. This ain't the musicians church. No, this is God's church. Amen. We don't really own the bands. We just stewards of God's bands. Uh, we don't really own the church. We just stewards of this building. All of this belongs to the Lord and it has to be done for his glory so you can't have the mindset of Christ unless you humble yourself before the Lord and realize it's all about God's plan God's will and God's agenda it is not for our glory it is not for our recognition it is not for on our honor this is all God's we are just stewards and managers of all that God has put us in charge of and when all is said and done you want to be found faithful over what God gave you. All that we've got to do has to be for the honor of God. All that we do must eventually lead to God that we love being served, being exalted in the earth. It's not about us. But all, uh, but all about God. He said, do nothing out of vain ambition or selfish conceit. And this humility that we have should be birthed out of a thankfulness and gratitude that we have for all that God has done for us. We can never forget that God brought us out of darkness. When we forget that, we become arrogant. 
Uh, we can't forget that if it had not been for the Lord, if it hadn't been for the grace and mercy of God, we would not be here. We can't forget that it was God who delivered, God who saved us from destruction. We were sinners, amen, on our way to judgment, but God stepped in, hallelujah, with grace and mercy and saved us from the judgment. Our humility before God is anchored in the idea that if God hadn't have been merciful, if God hadn't have been loving, if God hadn't have been kind, we would not have anything. That's why Paul shares in verse 1, if you have any encouragement or any comfort from being united in Christ. Now check this out. Paul isn't questioning and saying, do you have any comfort? It's really a rhetorical question. He knows you have comfort. Surely God has blessed you. Surely you have felt the tenderness of the Lord in your life. Surely you felt the love of God, the compassion of God. Surely you've been given the best thing ever when you receive the greatest gift of all time, Jesus Christ in your life. These are rhetorical questions. He isn't asking you, did you receive any comfort? He knows you got the comfort of God. He isn't asking you, have you been, been benefited from the mercies of God every morning? He sees you woke up this morning and you're in your right mind and you got all the activities of your life. He knows how God has blessed you. He was there when God sent the money. He was there when God opened the door. He was there when God made the way. He's not asking you whether God, you've been blessed. He's saying, surely you've been blessed. Sometimes folks ask a question not for you to respond, but to remind you what the answer is. Oh, he, surely Christ has blessed you, and, uh, and, he got, and there's got to be an act of gratitude. Well, we, we are humble before God because God has blessed us. Christ didn't have to, but he voluntarily humbled himself so that we might have the tree, uh, the, the gift of life. We might have salvation. We might have an eternal home. We might have an abundant life. Christ did all of that. He humbled himself so that we might have. He didn't have to, but he did it. Uh, and, and now, guess what? We have to serve, and we must serve. The mindset of Christ first reminds us we've got to be humble before God, but also the mindset of Christ reminds us we've got to be humble before one another. Let me say it again. We've got to be humble before others. Paul says we ought to humble ourselves to others. Valuing, he says this, valuing others, the text says, above yourselves. He says value others above yourself. Let's just take the first part of that, valuing others. My God, that, that, that's not what we often do in this world. Folks are quick, y'all, to devalue others. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Folks are quick to dismiss others. Folks are quick to look down on others and see them as less than. That is not how we are to function in the church. The person needs you, and guess what? You need to see that they are valuable and that you probably need them as well more than you think. We must value others. That means we should appreciate each other. We should bless each other. That means we should look out for each other, pay special attention to those who may be left out out or looked over. Give special attention to those who don't have as much as we need or need extra. We must value each other. That means we got to be careful with our words, careful with our tone. Oh, y'all not hearing what I'm saying. We've got to, if I value you, I'm not going to talk to you any kind of way. Oh, it's getting real quiet in here. That's all right. I'm going to keep on preaching. If we value each other, I'll be considerate of you. I will take you into consideration before I've got to value you. Uh, then, then it says value others. Check this out. Above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Amen. That's, that's what it says. That's, that's verse 4. Uh, wow. Wow. He said, uh, wow. Uh, oh, this is not saying you don't take care of yourself. But it does mean that we are very very concerned and act with compassion uh, and, and regularly to those who need it when, and need what we can provide. Let me say it again. It doesn't mean that we don't take care of ourselves, but what it does mean is that we are very concerned and very compassionate to regularly help out those who need what we can provide. Oh, man, we, are, we, we very much need to be concerned about the needs of others. Basically, if we're, if, look, check this out. If we're all concerned with each other, we'll all be taken care of. Y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. If we all are concerned with each other, we will take care of each other. If, now, watch this. If we become self-centered, we'll be neglecting one another, and then we'll all eventually suffer. 
So listen, if we all are concerned with each other, we'll take care of each other and everybody will take care. But if we begin to get self-centered, look to our own interests, folk will be neglected and then eventually you will be neglected yourself. It's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing if we all have the same concern for one another. The mindset of Christ humbles itself before God, but also the mindset of Christ humbles itself before one another. Hallelujah, somebody. And then I like it. He in verse, uh, in verse 14, he says, do everything, hallelujah, without grumbling or arguing. <sighs> let, me, let me break, let me deal with the grumbling part first. The grumbling part looks like this. Someone asked you to do something, it wasn't a hard thing to do, and you didn't want to do it. It's kind of like, you know, uh, we'll say something like this. Okay, just follow that procedure. Well, I got to follow the procedures. <laughs> we did not ask you to skin a hog. We asked you to sit on the right side. Grumbling. Whew. They, they did not have a class on that when I was at seminary. They just threw me out here to the wolves. I didn't know. This is what was giving Moses a nervous wreck. Moses going through a nervous breakdown. Because every time God was sitting to Moses, God would then try to share it to the people for the benefit of the people, for the blessing of the people, to make sure the people were taken care. And they would grumble against Moses. You know, let me tell you something. It is not easy serving the people of God. Now, I'm not even talking about me as a pastor. It ain't easy being a worker around here. Y'all make some stuff hard for some folk. Not y'all, the folk that ain't here. But you, all of y'all are perfect in all your ways. No air in you at all. But you know somebody. Grumbling. Let me tell you something. It's hard enough to work for the Lord. People that work for the Lord, half of them are volunteers, definitely don't need the grumbling. The little snide remarks, the little comments. Amen. It, I, I'm honest, it doesn't really happen to me a lot, but it happens to a lot of other folk around here, and it, it hurts me. Because I know how hard folk work around here. And they working hard, trying to make something good for you and or good for somebody in the church. And all they hear is grumbling, complaining. And they did not have to volunteer their time. So what we got to do, we, let me tell you, I'm going to tell you how we get around the grumbling. We got to start radically appreciating amen, especially the volunteer, especially the folk, amen, who ain't, it ain't a job for them. See, that's, I'm not talking about myself. I am fine. But there's some folk around here y'all need to show a little bit more appreciation to, amen, should be a little more grateful, a little more thankful. Let everything be done without grumbling. Hallelujah, hallelujah, and complaining. Amen. You ain't going to argue. You ain't doing it. You know, you knew they was going to have a meet. You knew they had to be do. You waited today to meet, ten, have 10 meetings, didn't do it for you to say something. You could have came to the first meeting, amen, and let your comments be known, but you let them do all that. Okay, I'm going to get in trouble right now. The problem with that is, is it, 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 it makes us look like we're not on one accord. And when you're not on one accord, it means we are not having the same mind. And let me help you with the same mind. The same mind isn't you agreeing with me. The same mindset is when you and I align ourselves up with Christ. And so when you, we have the discord and thing, and, and we don't have a lot of problems at Second Baptist, but I'm, I'm just preaching the text. We, you know, the idea is that if we, get, if we all align ourselves with God's plan, God's will, we'll be on one accord and we will have the same mind and we will be united. He said, well, when you have the mindset of Christ, grumbling or arguing or complaining is not part of the mindset of Christ. And he says that so when you do that, if you, you, you know, you, you do it without grumbling, you do it without complaining, we look like stars in this dark world. What you don't want to do is a church to look just like the world. 
We are supposed to shine like stars in this dark world, not blend in with the darkness. When you have the mindset of Christ, you are protective of the church, and you're going to say, you know what, I, I'm not going to allow us to complain or argue because we got to look better. We've got to shine, amen. So that means we're going to be slow, amen, to anger, quick to forgive, slow to speak, quick to listen, and we're going to work this out, and we're going to be quick to reconcile. We're not going to backbite. We're not going to tattle. We're going to work it out. Hey, we're going to get together because the thing is, this is about God's work. This is about God's plan, God's vision vision in the world. Amen. And when you humble yourself before God, humble yourself for one another, not grumbling, not arguing, not complaining. We're doing all that. The scriptures say here that when Christ humbled himself, God exalted him. Can I give you a blessing on this by having the mindset of Christ? When you have the mindset of Christ and you humble yourself before God, humble yourself before one another, the good news is God will exalt you and lift you up and reward you for being obedient, wash feet, serve and honor one another, respect one another, bless one another, appreciate one another, put others' needs before yourself, and when you put others, God will lift you up. I am a witness. I've seen God do it over and over again. There is a reward for serving, honoring others in, above yourself. There is an honor and a reward that God gives you. You may have to go through some suffering. You may have to go through some issue, but I'm here to let you know God will lift you up in due season. Marsha liked to sing that song. The payday after a while. The, the serving the Lord pays after a while. God will lift you. And the good news, when God lifts you, Brother Melvin, amen, when God lifts you, Sister Tracy, man can't knock you down. When God exalts you, they can't know nothing in the world can change anything. When God picks you up and God blesses you. Oh, that's the sermon for today. Stand to your feet. We need, we need the mindset of Christ. Humility, serving, honoring one another. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, I got good news for you. God can save your soul right here, right today, right over the phone, right over through line. If you're online, call us right now, 804-232-5124. The number should be coming up. Call us right now. We will talk to you about how you can have a relationship with the Lord. If you're here, our ministers, deacons, and deaconesses are available to talk to you. If you're here and you're ready to receive Christ, you're ready to join our church, this is a great opportunity. You can join the church anytime, but we encourage you right now to make that move, step out of y'all and say, yes, I'm ready to give my life to Christ. I'm ready to join this church. Come now as this choir sings this hymn of invitation. Let the Lord speak to your heart. You know it's time for you to get connected. You don't want to miss out on being connected to a church. Amen. Come now. Choir brothers, lead us now. that the love of God has no limits. The love of God is available to anyone. No matter how far you've gone, you've never gone out of God's reach. Let me say that again. You've never gotten out of God's reach. You've never gone so far where you exceeded the bounds of God's love or God's grace or God's mercy. God is just waiting on you to make a decision. If you need Christ to save you, come. If you need a church home, come. Amen. You may be seated. The good news is we've got several that have recently come. We're not sure if everyone is here today, but if you finish your classes and you're ready for the right hand of fellowship and you're present, we ask you to come up right now so that we can give you, amen, the right hand of fellowship. 
And I do want you to know, uh, Brother Earl Wright is not here, but we're going to go to his home today. He's not doing well. We're going to go and give him the uh, uh, right hand of fellowship at his house. Amen. To God be the glory. So praise for her. Brother Matthews, amen. That's Sheila's husband. Thank you for God. Amen. Glad to have him. You joined, was it 2020? 2020. Amen. Glad to have you. A uh, uh, young Brooke Elam. Amen. She was baptized recently. Praise God. Her and her brother. Amen. And Sister Woolens, to God be the glory. Amen. Let's give God some praise for some of our new members. Now, our role and responsibility today is we're going to pray over you. Is that second battle? Would you stand? We normally, on, we were not going to shake a lot of hands, but we normally would have a line of folk to shake your hands. So we're going to do a virtual shake. Amen. <laughs> today. But our goal, we want to pray over you. Second battle, let's pray. For Sister Woolens, Brother and Sister Elam, Sister Friday, Brother Matthews, the young hunter, brother and sister here. Lord, we pray, Lord, for your blessings over them. Bless them in a mighty way. Bless Sharon, bless Adrian, bless Sister Williams, bless, bro, bless Brother Matthews, bless brother, Sister Friday in a special way. Touch their lives. Lord, use them in a mighty and powerful way. Bless them, give them favor and grace at their homes, at their work, if they're retired, bless them, if they're in school, bless them. Lord, you do everything they need. Move in their lives. Do a great work and continue to do a great work in them. And bless them as we at Second Bat will gather around them to strengthen and encourage them in Jesus' name. And all the people of God said, amen. I'm going to ask our new members to come stand right here. Amen, right here. They want you to stand right here. Follow Deacon. Come right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go right there. It's our custom, amen. Our newest members, we have them on the front row to serve them all communion at the same time. I'm going to ask you to, to stand as we prepare to say our church covenant. Our church covenant will be placed up on the screen. Let's prepare to read our church covenant. Let's do it together. Having been led, as we believe, by the Spirit of God, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we do now, in the presence of God, angels, and this assembly, most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another. As one body in Christ, 
We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to promote its worship, prosperity, and spirituality, to sustain its ordinances, disciplines, and doctrines, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, and the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We also engage to maintain family and secret devotions, to religiously educate our children, to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintances, to walk circumspectly in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, and exemplary in our deportment, to avoid all tattling and backbiting and excessive anger, to abstain from the illegal sale and excessive use of intoxicating drinks as a beverage, seek God's help in abstaining from all practices which bring unwarranted harm to the body or jeopardize our own or others' faith, and to be zealous in our efforts to advance the kingdom of our Savior. We further engage to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy in feeling and courtesy in speech, to be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation and mindful of the rules of our Savior to secure it without delay. We moreover engage that we remove from this place, we will as soon as possible unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. And now unto him who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, be power and glory forever. Amen. Amen. If you notice, a lot of the stuff in my sermon was in the church covenant. Amen. <laughs> that was intentional. You can take your seats if you need to be seated. When we talk about communion, we have to go back in the 2,000 plus years when Jesus had gathered his disciples for what probably was the Passover meal. The Passover meal had been an ancient tradition of the, the Hebrews and Israelites to celebrate God's grace and how God saved them during the time of the Egyptians. They would have this meal, and there was various elements of that meal, lamb, bread, and there was wine. And Jesus in that moment showed the disciples with that ritual they had done for centuries really meant. The lamb there was representing that he would come and be the lamb of God to die for their sins. The wine would represent his blood that would be spilled. And the bread at that meal would remind them of his broken body that would be broken just for them. They'd eaten that meal for years and those who had known that meal and now it was being fulfilled in Christ. And so at, at that moment, Jesus, he took the bread and he broke the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. He took the cup and said, this is my blood that was spilled for you. And as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you'll remember my death until I return. And so we come to the communion table today with, with symbols of that bread and that wine, the little wafer, the, little, the juice, symbolic to remind us of the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross, how he was a sacrificial lamb for our sins, how his body was broken, how his blood was spilled. We eat this to celebrate his resurrection and his sacrifice. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Like any time you come to a meal, we say we come with thanksgiving. Lord, we come to the Lord's table today to eat the symbolic meal of your, your death, burial, and resurrection. We thank you, Lord, for you lowered yourself so that we might have life. You were the greatest, but then came to serve the least. And now I've set an example for us to follow in the same way. And so, Lord, let we come to you for asking for forgiveness of our sins and cleansing of all unrighteousness. Give us the mind of Christ. 
so that mind that was in Christ would be also in us. Allow the Spirit of God to help us every day to line ourselves up with your will, to humble ourselves before you, and to humble ourselves before one another. Bless this time in Jesus' name. And all the people of God said, amen. amen. Let us eat and drink together. And let the church say amen. 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 There's a little, little, a little pocket in the seat in front of you. You, you can place your, your cup if you need to. Or put it in your plastic, put it back in the plastic wrap and you can toss in the trash on the way out. But let's stand as we receive the benediction on today. God, we thank you for your grace, and we thank you for your mercy. Lord, help us to do everything without grumbling and arguing. Help us to put others before ourselves. Help us not to do anything out of vain conceit or vain ambition, but to put others before ourselves, to honor you in everything that we do. Lord, we ought to be the church that shines like stars in the sky. And all for us to do that, we've got to have the mindset of Christ that helps us to be humble and not arrogant, patient, not rash, loving, and kind. Now bless us, Lord, during this week to be the church and the people of God that you called us to be. In Jesus' name, and all the people of God said amen and amen. Don't forget the farmer's market has vegetables outside if you want to purchase some vegetables out in the fellowship hall.